Good morning, and welcome to our Sunday devotional for Sunday, March 21st, 2021, the fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. Our silent meditation for this morning is, and this is by A.W. Tozer, You have been forgiven, so act like it. You have been forgiven, so act like it. What a great message. For announcements this morning, we continue with our Wednesday midweek Lenten services, and again we're over at St. Paul's in Sacramento on the 24th, and the topic for that night will be the deadly sin of wrath or anger. And boy, how that gets us in trouble. Other reminders, uh, St. Paul's is having their Italian night this coming Saturday, the 27th, from 4 to 6 p.m., and that's curbside pickup only. So if you're in the area and want to feed yourself or your family, please stop by. They make wonderful Italian food. I believe those are all the announcements for right now. So let's continue with our worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Our profession of faith is adapted from Hebrews chapter 5. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And let's join in our call to worship. Have mercy on your people, O God. Wash us. Have mercy on your people, O God. Cleanse us. Make us more perfect in your love. Open the skies and pour down your grace upon your people. Open our hearts to hear your voice. Let the thunder of your presence awaken us. Have mercy on your people, O God. Restore within us the joy of your salvation. Draw us nearer to Jesus, our Christ. And please join me in the spirit of prayer. God of love and mercy, Open our hearts to your presence as we worship you this day. Whether our hearts are filled with celebration or with loud cries and tears, remind us that you are the source of our eternal salvation. Give us the strength to respond faithfully to your transforming love, that the joy of your salvation might shine in and through us all. Wipe away our wrongdoing clean our hearts, and make us more perfect. For it is in your perfect love that we are drawn more fully into your image. In the name of the glorified Christ, we pray. Amen. As far back as the prophet Jeremiah, a time was foretold when God would forgive sin completely and remember it no more. Jesus fulfills this promise through the cross, drawing all people to himself and offering them eternal salvation. Let us admit our need of forgiveness and draw near to Jesus using the words of an old hymn. Ah, holy Jesus, how hast thou offended that we to judge thee have in hate pretended? by foes derided, by thine own rejected, O oh, most afflicted. Who was the guilty? Who brought this upon thee? Alas, my treason, Jesus, hath undone thee. Twas I, Lord Jesus, I it was denied thee. I crucified thee. Therefore, kind Jesus, since I cannot pay thee, I do adore thee, and will ever pray thee, think on thy pity, and thy love unswerving, not my deserving. 
Amen. Powerful words in that hymn. Let's take a few moments for silent reflection and confession. The good news is that God promises to remember our sin no more, and we have indeed been drawn near to the heart of Jesus. Therefore we should be grateful and relieved, for we are forgiven, and we are saved. Thanks be to God. I would invite our young people to gather around the device, if they're not already there, for our children's time. And you take one look at that picture, and what do you see? Balloons. Balloons mean party, celebration, something happy. Maybe a um, birthday? Who knows? Maybe one of you is having a birthday today. But balloons always mean something joyous. But then, for our readers, what do you see there? What are the words on those balloons? doesn't say happy birthday or happy anniversary. No. It says something rather odd for a balloon. See, you are forgiven. I forgive you. Forgive and forget. Wow. Not what we expected. But I would tell you, there is nothing to be more joyous about than to know that we are forgiven by God. I mean, let's be honest, whether you're young or old, we all make mistakes, we all do bad things, things that we know are wrong, and sometimes people don't forgive us, <clears throat> but God does. I want you to know, when you go to God and ask to be forgiven for something, when you pray and admit you did something wrong, God will forgive you. That is something to celebrate because that forgiveness is what guarantees we will get to be with God in heaven. So remember that, <clears throat> excuse me, God forgives you and that is a party in itself. We come now to our time to gather prayers together. Um, Certainly we continue to pray for all the circumstances of the pandemic. But we also pray with gratitude that things are coming along. The vaccines are out there. I know not everyone's gotten them yet. I, I shared with the congregation a few weeks ago, I was feeling some vaccine envy because I'm hearing about people getting their first and even second shots and I hadn't even gotten mine yet. But we are grateful, grateful for the researchers and scientists, for the pharmaceuticals, even for two pharmaceuticals working together to help produce them. We're grateful and we look forward to a time when things can be a bit more normal. But we also remember those who are afflicted with the virus. And we remember all of our private circumstances the things that are known only to us and to God. So let's take a few moments of silent prayer to lift up all of these concerns and joys. And now let us join in the prayer that Jesus taught us. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. We come to our reading of scripture, and we begin this morning with the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, beginning with verse 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and remember their sin no more. Wonderful words there. <clears throat> Our psalm is Psalm 51, beginning with verse 1, and the notes say, To the leader, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him, after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence, and blameless when you pass judgment. <clears throat> Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being, therefore, Teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. And our gospel comes from John, chapter 12, beginning with verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies... It bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death 
he was to die. Here end our readings for this morning. And our message for today is entitled, Truly Forgiven, with a question mark. Truly Forgiven. But please join me now for a moment of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In that silent meditation, that quote, I love it. I love that quote by A.W. Tozer. You have been forgiven, so act like it. A leader of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, Toza was convinced that the fate of every human being hung on whether we believed we were forgiven by God or not. And that, in turn, depended on what a person actually believed about Jesus Christ. And we'll come back to that last part later. <clears throat> For now, let's consider people's honest view of themselves as either being forgiven or not. Now, of course, for some people, their hearts have become so hardened over the years that they have no consideration as to whether they're forgiven or not. They have steeled themselves against their own consciences for so long that it no longer crosses their mind, <laughs> never mind their heart, that they might not lead a perfect life, that they might therefore be in need of forgiveness. Well, such hard-hearted people will have to leave to the mercy of God. But for the rest of us, those of us who still feel a pang of conscience when we do wrong, the idea of forgiveness is always there, at least in the back of our minds. Even as the wrongs and sins accumulate, we have at least a vague sense that we're accumulating a debt that will someday have to be paid. This is precisely, <clears throat> excuse me, this is precisely where our faith as Christians should come into play. Now, in our heads, we know that Jeremiah's prophecy has been fulfilled, that God will forgive our iniquity and remember our sin no more. We know that Jesus paid for our sins by dying on the cross. We've been taught this all our lives. Likewise, we know in our heads that Jesus' promise was fulfilled on Calvary when he said, When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And we know that we, as followers of Jesus, have indeed been drawn close to our Savior. But all of this head knowledge doesn't amount to a hill of beans when the rubber meets the road. Too many times I have sat with someone near death, a church member, mind you, only to have them say that they don't know if they're going up or going down. When they died, that is. <sighs> and if it weren't totally out of line, I would like, at that moment, to whoop them upside the head with a brick and ask them rather loudly, what in the world have you really been believing all your life? Of course, I haven't and wouldn't do that. And instead I restrain myself and gently remind them that because they believe that Jesus died for them, they have no reason to wonder where they are going when they die. They are going up, of course. Jesus has already taken care of everything for them. But perhaps now you see my frustration when someone asks such a question. On the one hand, I appreciate the person's honesty, and it gives us a good chance to get down to the meat of our faith. But on the other hand, how had they somehow missed, maybe for their entire lives, what our faith is all about. If we do not believe that Jesus paid for our sins through his death, and that he proved that heaven was now open to us 
to his resurrection. If we do not believe these key things, then Jesus died a pointless death. He was just another Messiah wannabe, a misguided prophet, a sadly deluded human being, and only human. If we do not believe that Jesus' death atoned for us, set us back in right relation with God, then everything else we say and do in church is a complete waste of time. Church is then nothing more than a quaint social club for friends and family. And all our rituals and symbols and sacraments, they're just nice decorations and traditions, but they don't point to any greater realities beyond themselves. But mind you, when we talk about believing that Jesus died for us, saved us, is waiting to welcome us, this cannot just be head knowledge. <clears throat> we already talked some about that last week. No, <clears throat> if we really believe all this, then it should show in our actions, in our lives. A person who gives lip service to being forgiven doesn't look much different from anybody else. But a person who truly understands and appreciates what it is to be forgiven, a person who knows the real depths of their own sin and the dark places of their soul, now that person will live a life of gratitude and lightness. I admit, and my wife often reminds me, I don't smile enough. <clears throat> And as I look at people on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't see many people who have a natural smile. Most people I see, myself included, we have a more, well, not quite that, maybe that, a more serious look on our face most of the time. But don't judge a soul by its face. Because I remember May. Now she'd be 96 this year if she were still alive. Now May's normal facial expression might have looked like a sourpuss to a stranger. But to someone who knew her, there was just the slightest twinkle in her eye, and she could easily burst into smiles and laughter. There was an old soul who knew not just with her head, but with her heart as well, where she was going when she died. And now that twinkle and that smile, they're no doubt a permanent fixture on her face up in heaven. Point being, that we might not all rejoice, rejoice, again I say rejoice, the way Paul tells us to. But for us who truly know where we are going when we die, there is at least an inner smile, an inner joy in our hearts. And again, this is a joy born of deep gratitude, and that gratitude is in response to a God who plumbs the depths of our souls and scours them clean, no matter what might be lurking there. This is why we continue to confess our sins, both here in church and in our daily prayers. Yes, we are already completely forgiven, and yes, we are irrevocably saved. But we still need to confess our sins regularly to keep our relations with God open and honest. And confessing our sins is a good way of reminding ourselves, on a daily basis at least, of how great a gift God has given us by forgiving us and welcoming us home. Now, <clears throat> Back to A. W. Tozer. As I mentioned, he was convinced that the pivotal point in every person's life was whether they believed they were forgiven or not. And now, of course, only a person who is aware of their sins knows that they need to be forgiven. And even then, just because you know you need to be forgiven, that doesn't mean you know where to turn to ask for forgiveness. Or even if you know that, it doesn't mean you will actually humble yourself enough to actually ask for that forgiveness. 
Now, if you've gotten all this right so far, knowing you need forgiveness, being willing to ask for forgiveness, and knowing who to go to to get that forgiveness, so far so good. Your heart is in the right place. <clears throat> but now your brain might start to ask questions. <clears throat> Not about whether you're really all that bad. Yeah. You already know that even a single wrongdoing would be enough to get in the way. And certainly not about whether you're going up or going down. You've worked through all that as well. But you might start to wonder just exactly how all this forgiveness and salvation happens. And this is where a little bit of doctrine matters. Or as A.W. Tozer would say, it matters who you think Jesus Christ is. Now we know from Scripture <clears throat> and from the personal testimony of countless faithful believers down through the ages, we know that Jesus of Nazareth was somehow both human like us and yet also God. We call this the incarnation, meaning that God took on a human body in the form of Jesus Christ. It is this unique combination of being completely human, just like us, and completely divine that enables this whole forgiveness thing to work. You see, in Adam's fall, way back, Adam's fall, sin was introduced into the world, and we all inherited that tendency to rebel against God, something that we call original sin. This is what prevents us from reconnecting with God, because God cannot tolerate sin. To fix things for us human beings, to repair the breach, would therefore require a human being. But all human beings are sinful, so it would seem there's no rescue for us, except except that Jesus, born as a human being, was able to lead a perfect and sinless life. Jesus could be our champion and fix what Adam and the rest of us had messed up. And as Jesus himself told his followers in today's reading, that is exactly what he would do when he was lifted up on the cross. The one and only perfect human being paid the price that no one else could pay and reset the scales of God's justice. Now, putting heart and head together, we can both understand God's forgiveness with our heads and feel God's forgiveness with our grateful hearts. We acknowledge our deep need of God's mercy, <clears throat> and through the saving act of Jesus, we receive that mercy, meaning that <clears throat> we are truly forgiven, no question about it. And if we understand and appreciate that, then we should, in the words of A.W. Tozer, act like it. Amen. By the generosity of many people, ministries of our churches have been able to continue even during the pandemic, providing food for the local food banks, clothing for the local shelters, and supporting various other collections and needs as they have arisen. We are grateful for that. And so let us now lift up this morning's offerings for God's blessings. God of mercy, we present our gifts this day not to repay you for forgiving us, for we could never repay the cost of Jesus' life. Instead, we lift up our offerings in gratitude for your mercy, and we ask that through these gifts, others would be drawn to you, and that they would discover that you will gladly remember their sins no more. Amen. Friends, we have been given 
the gift of salvation and eternal life. This is not of our own doing, but it is the free gift of God through Jesus Christ. Now may God create in us clean and transformed hearts to know, seek, cherish, and live out both the justice and mercy of our Lord. Amen.